grace, mercy, and peace uh, to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name, of course, that we welcome you to worship this evening at First Presbyterian Church. Uh, we know, as we often say, that this is much more than a tradition of our local congregation. We believe that this is the best way to honor the Lord's Day, to keep the Sabbath and to honor it rightly as God has commanded for us in the scriptures. We are reminded so often, aren't we, that uh, God does not ask us to give just an hour of this day unto him. He asks us to give him the whole day. And so we come to worship our God in the splendor of holiness again together, joining uh, the church before us in the Old Testament as they offered evening and morning sacrifices unto their Lord, joining the church triumphant in heaven as the angels cry both day and night, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Of course, we come to offer our praises unto the Lamb who was slain. And slain for the sake of his people. And so through the atoning blood of Christ are we allowed access into his presence. We know that there is only one mediator between God and man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And by his spirit that he has sent unto us and that now dwells in us. Uh, we come boldly and without hindrance to, to join the angels above in singing and in praying. And to offering the Lord thanksgivings for what he has done. Of course, there are announcements on the back of your bulletin on page 8. Uh, some of those have already passed, like the recital. We had a great recital this afternoon uh, celebrating Rainey uh, Coleman's Senior Voice recital and enjoying some time of fellowship after that recital. And you'll notice that there are different events for the children and youth uh, happening tonight and this week. Uh, and then also be, uh, be reminded that our uh, men's book study meets Tuesday mornings at 6 a.m., and then the ladies are meeting throughout the week doing their Bible study on the book of Hosea as well. Prayer meeting will be uh, this Wednesday evening at 6.30. We hope that you'll join us for that uh, as we join our hearts together uh, in prayer as a church, praying for the needs of our families and our church, uh, and offering, again, uh, thanksgivings to our Lord for the good gifts that he has given to us. Well, uh, you see there, our call to worship tonight comes from Psalm 108, verse 1 and verse 5. And so if you'll please stand as you're able and let's enter into worship together. My heart is steadfast, O God, and I will sing with all of my being. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens and let your glory be over all the earth. Well, if you'll take your hymn books in your hands, and we're going to sing Psalm 134. Psalm 134, Come Bless the Lord with One Accord. And this is a very familiar tune to us, uh, Old 100th, which is the same as the doxology. And so let us sing aloud together. God, we do come to you this evening, Lord. We do come, as Pastor Matt already said, to have this day bookend by coming in uh, to worship corporately, uh, Lord, as you would have us to. Um, Father, we uh, know that we 
come through uh, the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ through his righteousness. And Lord, we come uh, glad and thankful for uh, your reconciling work. Father, for saving us from the monotony and fallenness and cursed world in which we live. Uh, Lord, inestimably, infinitely greater, Lord, than anything that we can possibly imagine is to know you. And Father, for you to give your son and bring us into your presence is what you have done. So we thank you. We pray that you'd be with us tonight. Help us to worship. And Lord, please minister to us. We ask in Christ's name. And Lord, we do now come together uh, praying how Jesus taught the disciples to pray, praying together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom comes, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, if you would uh, just take your hymnal again and turn uh, to 231. Uh, this morning, of course, we heard and talked about or heard preach that uh, God is sovereign, that he is uh, sovereign over everything uh, in the universe, including our salvation uh, but God is sovereignly working, not just in our salvation, but in everything. And uh, God also is good. And he can, you know, the catechism, when we ask the children, if God, there's anything God can't do, it's yes, God can do all his holy will. Uh, because, of course, God cannot lie. God cannot be evil. But everything God does is right. And he can only do right because that's who he is. So we can have this trust and, and comfort uh, in the trials of life. So let's sing to our Lord together. Whatever my God ordains is right. Uh, hymn 231. <laughs> we come now to the time of uh, the reading of scripture. Um, 
and we're in Ecclesiastes chapter 6, so if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn there if you'd like to use a a pew Bible. Um, Our reading tonight will be on page 707, Um, again, 707 of our blue uh, pew Bibles, Ecclesiastes chapter 6, and as uh, we turn there, uh, we're reminded that as uh, I believe uh, Solomon, but as uh, we look at Ecclesiastes, that he's looking at the world, uh, again, from a view that's very common uh, in our own day. And uh, we'll see this refrain at the end of this chapter about uh, under the sun, as things appear under the sun, but really looking at things uh, not from an eternal perspective, not from God's view, but really from the view of of an atheist. Uh, If this is all that there is, uh, you'll see that he's come to the end of himself and And I would say actually the right conclusion that if there is no God, there is no afterlife, uh, this is sort of all there is, and then you just return to dust and and so forth. A very much prevailing uh, and incorrect worldview uh, pushed in our world and universities uh, today. But uh, if that is true, then truly there is no meaning to anything uh, that does happen. And uh, that's why we can look at this book and and often wonder what in the world is he talking about or... uh, But again, uh, of course, the point is that there is a God. And as we just sang, he's not just the creator. He's the sustainer, redeemer. Uh, Everything he has ordained is right. And uh, graciously, uh, we have hope and a genuine hope because, again, what we see is is not all that there is. So, again, um, God's word from Ecclesiastes. Uh, Let's ask him to bless this time and then uh, we'll read. Father, we know that we live not by bread alone, but from every word that proceeds from your mouth. We pray that uh, this word, your word, Lord, from Ecclesiastes uh, would uh, work in us who believe by your grace, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Hear God's word. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, and it lies heavy on mankind. A man to whom God gives wealth, possessions, and honor so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires. Yet God does not give him power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity. It is a grievous evil. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years, so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with life's good things, and he also has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. For it comes in vanity and goes in darkness, and in darkness its name is covered. Moreover, it has not seen the sun or known anything, yet it finds rest rather than he. Even though he should live a thousand years twice over, yet enjoy no good, do not all go to one place. All the toil of man is for his mouth, yet his appetite is not satisfied. For what advantage has the wise man over the fool? And what does the poor man have? And what does the poor man have who knows how to conduct himself before the living? Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the appetite. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. Whatever has come to be has already been named, and it is known what man is, and that he is not able to dispute with one stronger than he. The more words, the more vanity, and what is the advantage to man? For who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow? For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? Thus far, God's holy word, would he write its truths upon our hearts? Okay, well, we come to, as you can see or know, uh, the congregational selections for singing of psalms and hymns. So if you have a a choice uh, from the Trinity Psalter hymnal, uh, you can go ahead and shout it out and, and... 446, 446, Be Thou My Vision, uh, and we'll sing all five verses, just remain seated, and let's uh, sing this as a prayer to the Lord.
Well, let us return to our God in prayer together. God Almighty, Father, Son, and Spirit, you are holy, holy, holy. Even the angels above, as we gather in your courts this hour, are singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lamb. And Lord, we come acknowledging first your holiness, and we are thankful that you are a God who is so unlike us. And yet to us, you have condescended in the person and work of Jesus Christ. You have shown us your glory as the word became flesh to dwell amongst us, full of grace and full of truth. And you have imparted to us your spirit so that we might have that spirit of adoption that testifies to our spirit, reassuring us that we are children of God. And that assurance that the Holy Spirit brings, Lord, is such a gift unto us as your people. For we are a people who often wander far away from you. We are a people who are guilty of sin. We know, Lord, that we have left undone those things that we ought to have done, and we have not done those things that we ought to do. And we have this battle, this struggle within ourselves. We know that we're commanded to kill sin and to take off the old man and put on the new, and yet we are so comfortable in our iniquities. We want to treat them with tender care, hide them in the deepest places of our hearts. And yet, Lord... Our duty is to slay it. And so forgive those times that we have hidden our sin and our shame away from you. Forgive us of those times that we have not killed the sin that we ought to murder. And Lord, we confess that we are not the people that we ought to be. You have called us to be a people who are holy as you are holy. And you are God who has called us to love because you have first loved us. And yet we have been guilty of selfishness and pride. We have thought of ourselves too highly and you too lowly. We have considered ourselves our own God and not entrusted our lives day by day unto our great Father who is in heaven. And as we look upon ourselves, we admit, as the Apostle Paul admitted, we are the chief of sinners and we are wretched people. And yet in your steadfast love towards us, you constantly meet us with grace and mercy. Even as we heard from Psalm 103 this morning, Lord, you have taken our sin and you have cast them into the depths of the ocean and you have flung them as far as the east is from the west and you remember them no more. And not only, Lord, do you take away our guilt, but you take away our shame so that we might walk in the freedom of the gospel. And we are thankful. We are thankful that you have proclaimed us righteous due to Christ's righteousness being imputed to us. And we are thankful that your grace abounds all the more where our sin exists. So, Father, we pray that we would walk in the freedom and the confidence of Christ. We pray, Lord, that we would be about the duty of Christians, that we would love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that we would love our neighbor as ourselves that we would search the depths of our hearts according to your word and we would not neglect nor would we lament the work of the Spirit as he convicts us of our sinfulness. Lord, we pray that each and every time we come to your word that it would convict us of our shortcomings and that it would show us, Lord, our error so that we might correct ourselves and that we might slay sin and that we by the power of the spirit would be enabled more and more to look like Jesus and so Lord we do pray for our time in the scriptures here in just a few moments we pray that you would sanctify us by the truth your word is true and how good it is father that you have given us something that is absolutely true we know that the world around us says that truth is subjective and truth is defined, you know, by our emotions and by our feelings, and yet you have given us a sure word, a foundation, which is your word as it proclaims to us the gospel of God. And we pray, as we heard from the Apostle Paul, 
a number of weeks ago in 1 Corinthians that we would be careful in how we build up ourselves. That as the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ is laid by the effectual calling of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that we would build with things that last so that on the day of judgment we might not shrink back in fear, but that through the fire our life will remain. Lord, we pray that we would be about the good works that you have called us to do. We pray that we would be reflections of the light of the world, which is Jesus, our Savior, and that we would proclaim the hope and the salvation that he brings. We know, Lord, that many amongst us, our family, our friends, our co-workers outside of these doors are so hopeless in this world that is full of sin. But we have the hope of the resurrection as we just sung. That just as Jesus Christ lives, so shall we live. And that is a hopeful, already, not yet. We can experience and enjoy the power of the resurrection right now. And yet there is a day that is coming that is far better. That we see you face to face, not in shadow form. Not as a veil hides our eyes, but we would see you as you are. And the beauty of the gospel, Lord, is as we see you, we will be like you. And we long for the day that our sanctification is complete. We long for the day that we do not fall in the face of temptation. And we do not fall short of your glorious standards. But we, like our elder brother Jesus, are righteous. And so, Lord, we pray along with the Apostle John that you would come quickly. That you would consummate your kingdom that you would usher us into the new heavens and the new earth so that we might join for eternity the angels and the saints of old gathered around the throne singing worthy is the lamb lord we pray until then that we would be faithful we know lord that you will uh, judge us according to our good works and that you will reward us according to the works that we do in thy name. And so, Lord, we pray that we would be faithful. We pray that we would be committed to the Lord's day. We pray that we would be, as husbands, committed to loving our wife as Christ loved the church. That as wives, we would be submissive to our husbands and looking to them as the God-ordained heads of our homes. As fathers and mothers, we would be diligent in the discipleship of the future generation. As grandparents, Lord, that we would be about the business of assisting these parents in raising up these children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. We pray for our church. We pray that we would be a church that is faithful. You have been faithful to us for the past 125 years, Lord, and we pray that out of gospel thanksgiving, we would... In turn, be faithful to you. Lord, may the gospel always be proclaimed from this pulpit boldly. May our Sunday school classes and our Bible studies and our Wednesday night programs, our women in the church, our men in the church, our youth group, our children's ministries, Lord, may it all be filled up with the scriptures so that we might see the fruit being born from your word going forth. Father, we pray that you would continue to grow us. First, spiritually, that we would see real sanctification happening within the people gathered here. But also, Lord, if it be your will numerically, we pray that we would make a lasting impact to our community and surrounding communities as our people gather here each and every Lord's Day to be trained up to sojourn well in this land that is not our home. Lord, we we want to see lasting impact from this church. Lord, you have providentially placed us right here in the heart of Dillon, and we pray that we would be a beacon of light and that we would be a city on a hill. Lord, we pray for our families that are represented here. We know that there are many families who are dealing with different trials and tribulations and hard circumstances. Father, we know that there are people here and we have family members here and friends here that are struggling with sickness and pain 
And we know, Lord, that, that one day all those things will be no more. That the needs of medicines will be no more. And the needs of surgeries will be no more. The needs of doctors will be no more. Yes, Lord, we give you thanks for those common graces. We give you thanks for giving doctors wisdom and medicines effectiveness. And yet, we long for the day that those things are not needed. Father, we long for the day that every tear is wiped away and there is no more death and no more sickness and no more pain. But until then, Lord, would you use even sickness and pain and mental anguish to prepare us for the eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison? We pray first and foremost that you would heal the bodies of those who are in need of your healing touch. And yet, if you do not desire to do so, we pray that we would see it as just light and momentary affliction that is preparing us for the glories of heaven. We pray, Lord, for our community. We pray for our state. We pray for our nation. Lord, we are in desperate need of revival. And so we pray, along with the prophet Isaiah, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Lord, we pray that you would pour out your spirit in abundance so that we might see exponential growth of your visible church, seeing sinners saved, covenant children being born, believers encouraged and sanctified. Father, we know that that work is done ordinarily through your word. And so make us a people who love your word. Make us a people who say there is much freedom in the commands of our Lord and that your word is sweeter than the honey of the honeycomb and more valuable than all the riches that this world has to offer. And so, Lord, we pray that we would love the scriptures, that we would be attentive to it, Lord, that we would be good hearers as we often pray, that not just only hear it with the ears, but that by your Holy Spirit, it, it makes an impact and makes application in our daily lives. Lord, even as the Apostle Paul here talks about pride and error, Lord, May your word kill pride within our hearts. And may your word direct us in the paths of righteousness that are true. Lord, we pray that you would speak loudly for us, your servants, are listening. And we need you to speak. And so, Lord, may we feast upon the scriptures this night. Knowing, Lord, that as we pay careful attention to it and as we hear you, Lord, we will be changed. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, if you will take out your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Pastor Don and myself uh, embarked on a, a steep endeavor a number of weeks ago, 15 weeks ago now, uh, of tackling both 1 and 2 Corinthians, Paul's Corinthian letters, and we're going to preach all the way through them. And tonight we have the next pericope before us, verses 14 through 21. Verses 14 through 21. Before we read our text, let me just remind you of what Pastor Don uh, preached for us last week in verses 8 through 13. Because really what is happening here in verses 8 through 13 is that the Apostle Paul is correcting what we would call today the prosperity gospel. And Paul does not mince words when he attacks this false teaching of the prosperity gospel because what's happening here in the church at Corinth is that they believe that they are to enjoy the consummated kingdom right this very second in its totality. And so Pastor Don spoke of that tension that we feel as believers that's already not yet. It's something like the resurrection power that we experience even now. We know that we can walk in resurrection victory right now. But at the very same time, there is a more fuller understanding of resurrection victory that we will experience in the glories of heaven. Where we receive for all eternity our glorified bodies. And, and that is far beyond our imagination, isn't it? And yet, what, what is happening here in the church of Corinth in verses 18 through 13 is they're saying this not yet can be experienced right now. And so Paul very bluntly, 
begins to kind of challenge them, doesn't he? He says, you think that you have all that you need, and you think you have all that you want, and yet I'm telling you that the way of the Christian life is one of often suffering. It is one that is often difficult. And he even points to himself, and he says, look at me. Uh, I have suffered for the kingdom of God. If you look back at verse 11 of your text, he says, To the present hour, he's talking about the apostles, we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless. And we labor, working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. And we have become and still are like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. And so he's saying, in the world's eyes, we are absolutely nothing. And this is not something that he has just kind of sprung on his audience here at the church of Corinth. He's already said, to the world, we are foolish. To the world, our message is foolish. To the world, I am nothing. There are people with great oratory skills. I'm not them. There are people with philosophical minds. I'm not them. I have been committed to preaching Christ and him crucified, which is total nonsense to the world. And because that is nonsense to the world, we have labored and labored hard. And, and we have worked with our own hands. And, and we have been persecuted. And we have been slandered. And we have had seasons of homelessness. And we have had seasons of depravity. We have had seasons where we are poorly dressed and not honored. But we are in disrepute, he says. And he actually uses very strong language there in verse 13. We are like the scum of the world. And, and if you think about the, the problem that, that the Apostle Paul is targeting here, you, you actually, it actually comes quite easy to, to understand why the Corinthians are dealing with a pride problem. And... And you understand why the, the Corinthian believers, as they have separated themselves into sects under Paul or Cephas or Apollos, why they begin to puff up their chests and look down upon the other believers. Because they would see believers suffering for the sake of Christ, and they would say, look at them. They're suffering. They must not have faith like we do. Or they are sick, so they must not be walking as close with Jesus as I do. Or, or they are poor, and therefore they must not honor and glorify the Lord as I do. And so Paul really targeting that, that pridefulness that exists. He says the real Christian must embrace this idea that they are sojourners in a strange land, pilgrims in a strange land, aliens in a land that is not our home. And if we are aliens, then we will be persecuted and we will be slandered and there will be times of great labor and there will be times when we must endure and there will be times in which we are considered the scum of the world and yet we must entreat even our enemies to repent and believe in the gospel. Our message cannot change because of our humility in our trusting in the Lord Jesus. And so he, he begins to say, begins to exhort these believers not to, to live in this mindset that they are in the glories of the best of the best that, that the gospel has to offer, but to live in this present hour. If you remember Pastor Don preaching last week, you remember that, that one of the key words of the of the misteachings, the false teachings of Corinth was already. Already you have. Already we are. Already we possess. And on the contrary, Paul says the alternative, the real Christian life is one that hungers and thirsts, yes, for righteousness, but often one that is, that is disdained in this world that is not our home. And, see, he, so, and so he wants the, the people of God here in Corinth to live in the present hour, to understand their place within this world, and to understand 
that there's a better day that is to come. And if you think about the, the false teaching of, of the prosperity gospel, there, there are really two options if you hold to that. If you believe that we now already have the best of the best that the Lord Jesus offers us, Either you will, as the Corinthians were doing, deceive yourself and think that you are somehow this hyper-spiritual cut above all the others that profess Christ. You would say that in this life we can live our best life now, and so it does fuel pride. Or you'll have the devastating effects of the lies of the devil making you believe that you are not good enough for the Lord Jesus, that your faith is not strong enough, that you are not honoring the Lord enough, and that you should be ashamed to even be considered a part of the church. And, and, and I, I've spoke to this uh, before, and I even spoke to my Pentecostal upbringing uh, this morning, but, but I've often kind of thought about my grandmother. My grandmother was a great Christian lady, a prayer warrior, but she bought into this televangelist prosperity gospel. And in any time that she had any sort of suffering in this life, whether it be wayward children or grandchildren, whether it be uh, the, the new Cadillac that she wanted in her driveway and she did not get it when she woke up the next morning, immediately... She would think that her sin and her sinfulness or her prayerlessness has led her to despair. And the Apostle Paul wants, yes, the believers to be assured of the gospel. And he wants their pride in their hearts to be killed. And so he speaks to them very pointedly in verses 8 through 13. And now in verses 14 through 21, Paul begins to, now that he has spoke very pointedly, begins to admonish as a spiritual father very lovingly and pastorally for the people here. And so reading again verses 14 through 21, uh, let us turn our attention to God's word. I do not write these things to make you ashamed but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless gods in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills. And I will find out, not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power, for the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod, or with love and a spirit of gentleness? Well, this is the word of God. May he write his eternal truths upon our hearts. Well, as many commentators argue, and I think they're right, Paul, now that he has very pointedly began to exhort the Corinthian believers here in verses 18 through 13, he begins to land this portion of this letter talking about the, the pridefulness of these believers in Corinth and these false teachers here in Corinth with very loving pastoral admonition. He actually says in verse 14, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. He, he wants them to be sanctified. He, he longs for them to, to walk in the ways of righteousness. He, he anticipates the day, I think we could say, where pride is no more within the household of faith there in Corinth, but, but that love for one another. And humility and the gospel are, are overflowing through these congregations in this region. 
And so he says, I'm not saying these things so that you might shrink back. I'm not saying these things so that you might feel as a scolded puppy. I'm saying these things to you so that you might actually pursue righteousness. And that is a a great father in the faith, isn't it? Doesn't he even say, you've had many gods in Christ. I actually think that's a little bit of a shot at these false teachers that are so prevalent in the Corinthian churches. But he says, you have not had many fathers. I think what he's saying here is that you have these people that will come and they will tickle your ears and they will say what you want them to say. And they will tell you how great you are and how spiritual you are and how you should be puffed up with pride because you are cut above everyone else. But as a father, I am here to correct you because I love you. You know, that was not something that I understood until I started having my own children. I would often say to my parents, you wouldn't spank me if you loved me. Or or you wouldn't ground me if you loved me. You wouldn't yell at me if you loved me. You wouldn't correct me if you loved me. But then I found very early on in my parenting days that itch to spank. And, and, And why did I do that? Because I longed for corrective nature of discipline. I I wanted to see Brooks and Anna Kate and now even Eliza to to walk in the ways that are glorifying to the Lord, to walk in a way that is presentable to the world. I wanted them to show forth the light of the gospel that they have been taught even from an early age. I I wanted them to, to walk, even young as they are, I wanted them to walk in the ways of righteousness. And the same was true for my parents. It's an act of love, isn't it? The discipline of a father to their children. And Paul says, as a father in the faith, remember he has planted this church, he has preached to them the gospel, he has labored amongst them, he has a deep desire to see them growing in Christ's likeness. I'm not going to tickle your ears, but I'm going to speak hard truths. And I'm going to speak hard truths so that you might further yourself in your relationship with Christ. And I think that dads and moms and grandparents, we we get this. We'll use all the tools at our disposal to, to reach our kids, to get through to them. Especially if you see them taking a wrong turn and going astray. I have been admonished by my parents more times than I can count, and it stings oftentimes. But the stinging nature of discipline and the stinging nature of correction is always done out of love. Now, I think that's a principle that fathers and mothers, but especially fathers and grandfathers, should be aware of. We are not called to belittle our children or to even shame our children. We are called to grow them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, to lead our homes in a way that our children are walking in the faith. And that means that we love them deeply because Christ has loved us deeply. And that means that we discipline when discipline is needed because Christ has disciplined us when discipline was needed. But anytime we see children, our own bloodline, Walking off that proverbial cliff will begin to correct them, and that is the right thing to do. And so it would be completely negligent for the Apostle Paul to see these issues within the church and to not address them, to not confront them very pointedly. But you notice that he also does it out of love. And he doesn't just give us these exhortations and and move along to the next section of The letter which speaks to sexual immorality and its defilement of the church. But you see that he actually goes through great lengths to say that if we're going to correct this, you must imitate me. Now that is is a tall order from the Apostle Paul. And we spoke to this a number of weeks ago already as we began to hint at where we were going within chapter 4 of this letter. Because Paul is not saying that he is some sort of super Christian that is worthy of imitation simply by the things that he has done. But he is saying that I have 
really been striving to be faithful. I have really been searching the scriptures. I have really been praying for the Lord to impart His Spirit to me. I have been attempting with all of my being to walk in the ways of Christ. And because I have imitated Christ, therefore you should imitate me. You see, it would be, again, very negligent for the Apostle Paul just to to give this blanketed exhortation and not tell the believers here in Corinth how best to go about executing or making this change. But he says, just as I have realized that we are not living in the alreadiness of the glories, the full glories, the total glories of heaven, but we have been persecuted and we have suffered. And and when we have been persecuted, we've endured. And when we have been suffering, we have been faithful. And when we have been slandered, we still entreat. He says, the ways that which we have done this is worthy of your imitation. And again, I think this goes right back to our fathers and our grandfathers, these heads of the home. I think we have to say as fathers that we have a call to be worthy of our children's imitation. And and as, as elders of the church, we have the tall order of walking in such faithfulness that we can say to the congregation, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And yes, that might seem as if Paul is trying to do the very thing that he has commanded the Corinthian believers not to do. Don't puff yourself up, but you notice how he's speaking. He's not puffing himself up, he's puffing Christ up. He's elevating Christ. I'm imitating Christ, therefore you imitate me. What is he saying? He's saying, ultimately... If you imitate me as I'm imitating Jesus, you are imitating Jesus. And so fathers and grandfathers, elders within the church, we should be following Jesus in such a way that if the people would imitate us, they would be imitating Christ. But you also notice here within the text, not only as a spiritual father does Paul hold himself out as an example to follow, but he he also... As one preacher says, he deploys big brother. He deploys big brother and he points in verse 17 to Timothy. He says, that is why I sent Timothy to you, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere and in every church. Now again, you think about the the, the ways in which parents will exhaust themselves trying to correct, lovingly admonish their children. And I, I wasn't uh, privileged to have an older brother, but I had an older cousin who I respected and grew up like a brother to me. Uh, his name was John. We called him John John through, uh, throughout my childhood. And oftentimes, if I wouldn't listen to my parents, my mom would go, John John. See if you can talk to Matt and get through to Matt. See if you can talk some sense into my son. That that is something very common that parents will do. They'll take this figure that that is respectable and and that is respectful, and, and they will say, won't you see if you can do something? And oftentimes that would work. And so Paul's saying, well, if you're not going to listen to me, at least listen to Timothy. I've sent Timothy to you so that you can see him as well. And he's imitating me as I imitate Jesus. And maybe this older brother might might get through to you. You notice how he talks about Timothy here. He talks about Timothy the same way that he talks about these believers in Corinth. I'm your father in the faith, people of Corinth. I am the father in the faith to Timothy. He is your big brother, so to speak. And so I'm sending him to you. I'm deploying him, putting him on a mission to to get through your thick skulls. That was something my parents always said. I'm going to get this through your thick skull so that you might be corrected. And you, you think about the way in which the Apostle Paul talks in verse 17. 
Because what, what is needed here within the household of faith in these churches of Corinth is this idea of discipleship amongst the people. It doesn't have to be just the pastor, or it doesn't have to be just the elders. But you remember those words of admonition and exhortation in Titus chapter 2, as we handled that a number of months ago now, as he commanded the older men to disciple the younger men and the older women to disciple the younger women. They are our elder brothers and sisters in the Lord, and yet it is the duty of leadership within the household of faith, within the church, like the Apostle Paul. To say, I'm sending them to you so that they will be corrected. So that you might be corrected. But but you notice, don't you, that it's not just, I've sent Timothy and I hope you'll listen to him. But he actually says something that, that parents say quite often. Don't make me come up there. You notice how he says that, don't you, in verses 18 through 21. He, he begins to talk about these false teachers, and he talks about shining the light, exposing them for their error. We'll get into that here in just a second. But, but notice the ways in which he writes in verse 21. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? I remember going and taking... Uh, our campus tour before my freshman year. And we were going through this tour and we were going through all the protocols and we were uh, acknowledging all the rules of the, of the dormitories and everything that goes on. And, and I remember my, my mom saying, leaning in and saying, you know I'm not scared to come up here. And, 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 and the thing about it is I, I knew my mom was telling the truth. Um, she was not scared to come up to Clemson and to correct me when correction was needed. And, and we began to talk about that a little bit. She says, I'll come up here, and, and I can't say exactly what she said from the pulpit, but essentially it says, you're not too old for a good spanking. Uh, when I visit, I would like it to be a time of, of pleasure. I would like it to be a pleasant experience. And, and something of that... Sword is being said here by the Apostle Paul. I'm coming, Lord willing. And I'll come with a rod to discipline or I'll come with a spirit of love and gentleness. Which one do you prefer? Don't make me come up there. And again, that is something that I did not totally grasp until Beth and I began to have our own children. Just a number of weeks ago... Uh, Little Eliza decided that she was going to take some, some diaper ointment and rub it all over the tile floors in our hallway. And so, of course, big brother and big sister come and, and uh, tattle on her, a, a good tattling, of course, because there's now A&D ointment all over the tile floor in our hallway. And as we were cleaning it up, we could hear Eliza rummaging through the cabinets in the master bathroom. And was the first thing that we said, Eliza, quit plundering in the bathroom, getting into stuff that you have no business being in. Don't make me stop cleaning this up to come in there. That's what the Apostle Paul is doing. <laughs> don't, don't make me come up there with the rod of correction. Don't, don't make me come with the rod of discipline. But, but by the power of the Spirit, correct yourself. Walk in the ways of righteousness. Kill, mortify the sin of pride that is within you. Walk in the ways of the Lord humbly before your God. You know, going back to these false teachers that he says that have tickled their ears, these, these countless gods that he references there in verse 15, he says, when I come... In verse 19, I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. And what is the Apostle Paul getting to? He's saying, when I come, I'm going to expose these false teachers. They, they tickle your ears with their oratory skills. They, they sound good. They puff you up. They use all these philosophical terms and ideologies. And, and yes, that is attractive, but I'm going to show you 
how it's all lip service. How it's all words of the mouth, but their heart has not been changed. And I can't help but to think about that and to think about the legalism of the Pharisees and the scribes that Jesus confronts repeatedly throughout the Gospels. You remember as he, as he rebukes them, he says, you've got all the outward trappings of religion. You pray, you fast, you keep the law, and, and in fact, you've made more laws and, and Props to you, Pharisees and scribes. You keep even the man-made laws, but your hearts are unchanged. When he talks about power here, I think that he is truly talking about the power of the Spirit that that conforms and changes the heart. You you might have all the, the language of faith. You might have all the outer workings of religion, but you have no real heart change. And I'm going to expose that. And I think as we close, I think that we really are left here with this threat. I'm coming. Do I need to come with discipline or do I need to come with gentleness? And this question in verse 21 really calls us to begin examining ourselves. Have we fallen into the error of the false teachers? Are we just giving lip service to faith? Are we just doing the outward workings and the trappings of religion? Or are we really experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit and revealing in our good works heart change? And that's a question that each and every one of us have to answer. For truly, the greater call is coming. I know that often we hear Old Testament characters and we talk about Jesus being the greater David or the greater Moses or the greater Joshua. But But that language can also apply to these these apostles of the New Testament. The greater is coming. The the greater teacher is coming. The Lord Jesus. And he'll come one day. And he'll come either with a rod of discipline against those who are reprobate and far from him. Or he'll come with love and a spirit of gentleness for those who belong to him. For those who just give lip service to faith. We've studied the Sermon on the Mount for a number of weeks during prayer meeting. They will be the ones who say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all the outward trappings of religion? And yet I'll tell them, depart from me, I did not know you. You worker of iniquity. But for those who are in Christ, they can can experience the second coming of the Lord Jesus with great confidence, knowing that when he comes, we will be met with grace and mercy and we'll be ushered into the new heavens and the new earth. And so examine yourself. Are we guilty of pride? Are we guilty of puffing ourselves up, saying that we're cut above the rest of our brothers and sisters in Jesus? Are we guilty of the error of these false teachers? Are we just giving lip service unto the king without really bending a knee to him and acknowledging him as the king of kings and the Lord of lords and the friend of sinners? And if we examine ourselves and we find that in our own life we've had mere head knowledge or mere talk, lip service to the things of faith, what are we to do? And I think Paul actually answers that question for us as he talks about Timothy in verse 17. He says the duty of Timothy as he comes is to remind you of my ways in Christ. Again, Paul is not puffing up himself. He's not puffing up Timothy. He is exalting Christ. My ways of walking in Christ. Paul saying, I have walked in the power of the Spirit. I have walked. I have really been striving to walk in step with the Spirit of God, doing what the Lord wills. It's not just lip service, but I have committed my life to this life of picking up my cross as Jesus did and following Him daily. And so if we find that our Christianity is just outward forms and gimmicks, if our Christianity is just mere lip service before the household of faith that is First Presbyterian Church here tonight, the answer is, 
to look to Christ. The, the answer is to come clean before Him and to admit our shortcomings and our sinfulness, to confess and to cry out to the Lord Jesus Christ for a reality of the power of the Spirit in our hearts if we want our faith to be more than just simple performance. We come to Christ and we say, it has been that for far too long, Lord Jesus. Now I really want to walk with you. And here's the promise of the gospel, that Jesus Christ will, will pierce your hardened heart. And he will replace that heart of stone and he will give you a heart of flesh and he will begin that renovation project within you. It will be long and it will be tedious and it will hurt. Conviction often does, doesn't it? Discipline always does, doesn't it? But, but what the Lord Jesus, through the Apostle Paul, is calling the Corinthians to is exactly what he's calling us to. Examine our hearts. Is it just mere talk or is there real heart change? And we pray all the more for that work of sanctification to be executed within us, to experience all the more the power and the privilege of truly being united to Jesus in faith and walking in the power and the freedom of his commands. And so, as we examine ourselves, may we look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, and the one who has said the good work that he has started in you, he will bring about to its completion. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your word. And we thank you, Lord, that your word searches us and tries us. And Lord, so rightfully your word convicts us. And so use this word, Lord Jesus, to convict where it ought to convict, encourage where it ought to encourage, so that we might grow up in Christ's likeness. Lord, impart your spirit to us in abundance. You tell us as our good heavenly father that if we ask for more of the spirit, you will faithfully and readily give him to us. And so, Lord, we want to walk more in the power of the Spirit. We want to be in step with the Spirit. And so enable us to do so, we ask, so that we might not just be giving mere lip service to the King, but that we would say that the King of kings and the Lord of lords is our Savior and our friend, our elder brother, Lord, we know that you are coming, and you are coming soon. And so let us not shrink back in shame and fear, and let us not be caught off guard, saying like those false disciples in Matthew chapter 6, Lord, Lord, didn't I do all these things in your name? And hear those sobering and damning words, depart from me, I never knew you. But at your coming, let us be full of joy, knowing that you come to meet us with great gentleness and love. And so, Father, may we, may we search our own hearts this night and may we see Christ clearly and may we imitate him as we walk in the ways of righteousness. In Christ's name we ask these things. Amen. Well, if you'll please stand for the benediction. Uh, you'll see after we pronounce the Lord's blessing that we'll sing the first stanza of Psalm 117 and you'll be reminded that it is to the tune of all creatures of our God and King. So receive the blessings of the Lord. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now until we reach heaven. Amen.